those who don't discern stuff, suffering. Sounds strange, because we all seem to discern suffering in our lives. We all know it's there. But we don't really discern it. That's the problem. We don't understand it. We don't comprehend it. Because as the Buddha said, if you really comprehended suffering, you wouldn't suffer. It's because you still don't understand it. There's still an element of ignorance there. And because there's ignorance, there's craving. We actually crave the things that will make us suffer. That's our problem. So we have to work on understanding our suffering. Some people say that this is a sort of a narrow or selfish spiritual goal, but it's not. The Buddha was intelligent enough to see that if you could cut through this one big piece of ignorance in your mind, you cut through all the important ignorance. In other words, all the important questions that you might have about experience, about life. You either see that there were dumb questions or you, can, you get their answer. So what we're doing as we come here is to learn about suffering. The Buddha once said that of all the things he learned in his awakening could be compared to all the leaves in the forest, whereas what he taught was well, a handful of leaves, a small amount. But he said that the reason he chose that small handful was because it really was useful in putting an end to suffering. The other things he had learned, he said, wouldn't serve that purpose. In fact, there was no real purpose in talking about them. They would distract people from the real problem. So, this is what the, the Buddha's first noble truth. Is it true? Is there suffering in life? Some people think that this, his first noble truth is that life is suffering, but that's not what he said. He simply said that just there is suffering. And is it there? Is there suffering? Is there stress? The word dukkha in Pali can cover a wide range of things, from very subtle stress to just out and out anguish. Have you ever met with any of that in your life? Of course we have. Everybody has. The question is how to find a systematic way to go about understanding it. So it's not our understanding of suffering is not just hit or miss. When you think about it, most of the strategies we've learned for dealing with suffering are things we picked up as children. We first encountered suffering as we came out of the womb. And there was nobody there to give us any advice on how to deal with it. People would comfort us. But it was the beginning of our internal dialogue, how to deal with this. What's going on here? Buddha once said that people's reaction to suffering is twofold. One, there's bewilderment. How did this happen? And then secondly, there's a search. Is there somebody who knows a way to put an end to the suffering? And even among small children, there's that same twofold reaction bewilderment and then a desire to have somebody else help. That's why they go running to their mothers. And after a while, after we learn how to speak, we can begin to articulate the problem both to ourselves and to other people. But in the meantime, before that happens, we've learned an awful lot of nonverbal ways of reacting to suffering, to pain. And many times we haven't unlearned those things, even as we've gotten older and come to understand things more. So we have to go back and look at the pain directly. But to do that, so that you don't feel threatened by it, you, give them, you need to give the mind a good, solid place to stay. This is why we practice concentration. This is why right concentration in the Buddhist teaching contains rapture, ease, pleasure among its factors. Because without that, you're just facing the suffering straight on. You feel threatened by it, overwhelmed by it sometimes. But if you have this good sense of well-being, centered, solid inside, then you can face down the suffering and really watch it and not feel threatened by it. Your gaze can be steady. This is important, because to understand something, you have to watch it continually. You have to see the process of cause and effect as it's actually happening. You can't take a peek right now and then come back a week later and take another peek again. 
You've got to look at it throughout the period to see how cause and effect are connected. So we understand where the suffering comes from, where the stress comes from. In particular, you want to understand how the stress and the suffering are accompanied by craving. Craving for sensual passion, craving for things to be a certain way or for yourself to be a certain way. Or once they get the way you like, you don't want them to change. You know, they're going to change anyhow. You want to see directly how this particular, these particular thought patterns are accompany stress. So to see those things, we have to make our gaze long and steady. And that's what we're doing as we're concentrating. Give the mind a good, comfortable place to stay. Keep it with the breath. This whole hour, see how long you can stay with the breath. If you wander off, bring it back. Wander off again, bring it back again. Try to get used to being with the breath so you can have that stable center as your vantage point from which you can watch the suffering, you can watch the stress as something separate. This is an important element in the path. What I said is learning how to see these things as separate and not identifying with them. That's what allows you to get beyond them, that's what allows you to understand them. So many things happen in the mind, so many things happen in our experience that we, without even thinking about it, identify with them. Either they're us or they're ours. But at the very least, there's a very strong connection where everything just gets glued together in the mind. What we're trying to do as we meditate is make the mind steady enough so we can begin to see that the things that initially looked glued together or melted together really are not. They're distinct. They're separate. They're discrete. Suffering comes, and it's not one big block, but it's lots of little sensations. The cravings we have are not big blocks either. They come as separate acts of the mind. And we really have to keep our mind steady so that we don't simply flow along with the flow of those things. It's like looking at a, a reel of movie film. As, as the reel moves past, we get deluded into thinking there's actually somebody up there on the screen moving around. But if you stop and look at the film itself, you see there are these little discrete frames. Nothing's happening in the frame, just things are so still in each frame. But it's because we let ourselves get deluded into just running right past these things. They look like they're moving. So we have to make the mind really still so we can see these individual events in the mind precisely for what they are. And that's when we can begin to discern suffering, to see how, how the craving actually gives rise to it and how the craving is not necessary. That's the important part. The Buddha said you, the duty with regard to craving is to let go of it. You can't let go of it and listen, until you see that it's unnecessary. It's causing stress, it's causing pain, and you don't need it. So many things happen in our minds that we think that's just simply the way it has to be. That's the way the mind has always worked for as long as we can remember, and we figure that's the way it's got to be. But when you stop and can be still enough and watch steadily enough, you begin to see that it doesn't have to be that way. There are certain choices that are being made that you missed before, but now as you're watching very carefully, you begin to see very clearly. What used to be on automatic pilot doesn't have to be set that way. You can change your default settings in the mind, and it can make a real difference. This may sound fairly abstract, but when you apply these insights into the way you react with other people, the way you react to events in your life, you see that they really do cut through a lot of suffering. It takes you out of the narratives that just pile the suffering on, takes you out of the issues that we create to no purpose at all. You begin to see how simple events get embroidered in the mind through our ignorance, through our craving, and the suffering piles on us. There's an interesting sutta where the Buddha talks about this process. In the beginning, it's all fairly impersonal. 
sensory events happen. And we there's a feeling, and then we begin to label them, and then we think about them. And once we start thinking about them, though, simple thinking is okay, but then we start embroidering. And when we embroider in the whole terms of our embroidery, our elaboration, the way we complicate these things, then they come around and we become the victim of them. At first we thought we were the agent, and then we become the victim of what we create. So in order to stop that, we have to see exactly what we're doing, realizing that the things that assail us in the mind, the sufferings we have, the ones that we cause ourselves are far greater than the suffering that other people, other events outside cause for us. This is good news because we can change the way we act. We may not be able to change the way of the world, but we can change our reaction to it. That's why we meditate, to develop the mindfulness, to develop the discernment that we need in order to see things clearly for what they are. And in doing so, we change not only change the way we perceive them, but we change the way we act. The intentions we have with regard to them are going to have to change because we see them in a new light, in a light that puts an end to suffering. Because we see suffering clearly, we can understand it. We can see that we don't have to suffer, and it's within our power not to. So this is something of what it means to discern suffering. Ultimately, it means discerning all four of the noble truths, seeing the cause of suffering, seeing what you do have to do in order to comprehend the suffering, and finally get to the point where you actually have gone beyond the suffering. That's full comprehension. But regardless of whether you get all the way to the end of the path or not, as long as you're on the path, you see suffering falling away. You're not piling things on, you're stripping the suffering away to whatever extent you can. It's all worthwhile. 